Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host, Peter High. My guest today is Orion Hindawi. Orion is the co-founder and chief executive officer of the cybersecurity firm Tanium, which helps large organizations manage and protect mission-critical networks. Orion founded the company in 2007 with his father, David Hindawi. Prior to founding Tanium, Orion and David founded the IT management company Big Fix and ran it until its acquisition by IBM. In this interview, we discuss the evolution of IT infrastructures and cybersecurity. Orion gives an overview of Tanium's business and discusses the changing ways companies look at adopting cybersecurity solutions. We also cover the digital and technological transformations that are necessary in order to optimize cybersecurity, the importance of curating strong ecosystems, and future opportunities for the company. Additionally, Orion shares his perspectives on applying business cybersecurity knowledge to maintaining personal cybersecurity, as well as his perspectives on the future of business in California. If you enjoy Technovation, please consider reading my new book, Getting to Nimble, How to Transform Your Company into a Digital Leader. The book is now available on Amazon. As a special offer to our CXO listeners, if you purchase 50 or more books for your team, I'd be happy to join your team for a group discussion on it. To learn more, please write us at information at metastrategy.com or visit gettingtonimble.com. Thank you. Orion Hindawi, welcome to Technovation. It's great to speak with you today. Thank you for having me. Well, Orion, you are the uh, co-founder, chief executive officer of Tanium, a company founded back in 2007. Um, many of our listeners will certainly be familiar with Tanium, but in the off chance, there are a few uh, who are less familiar. Maybe you could take a quick moment and provide an overview of the business. Sure. So we started the company with the basic thesis that very large companies, so you think about Fortune 500, large globals, big enterprise kind of environments, either in government or in the commercial side, uh, really struggled with basic stuff uh, around IT. So when we first get there, uh, a lot of companies really struggle to know how many assets they have. And when I say assets, I mean almost anything with a chip in it. So you think about desktop, laptop, server, VM, cloud, IoT, OT, like all these fun things that they've got. They don't know how many of them they have. Uh, they often don't know where they are, what they're doing, who's using them, what data's on them, what vulnerabilities they have. They really have very sparse data about uh, what they're trying to manage from a compute standpoint. And in addition to that, they've got tons and tons of little tools that are supposed to do that for them. So uh, in many cases, they've got 20 or 30 or sometimes even 50 tools that are designed to give them visibility on their IT assets. And yet the visibility is really pretty fractured and untrustworthy. So uh, what we've built is a platform that lets you see everything you've got with a chip in it, uh, really great data about them, and then allow you to change them. And so whether that's patching things because they've got vulnerabilities, whether it's finding data that shouldn't have spread somewhere and removing it, whether it's alerting users that they've got a performance issue and fixing it, uh, it's a really broad set of things that they want to fix. But uh, really kind of finding and fixing within the IT stack and having a system of record that they trust about all the things with chips in them that I think are becoming incredibly critical, especially in work from anywhere. But uh, frankly, even before that, we're super critical for almost every company we talk to. And, and uh, there's so many organizations, the complexity, the proliferation of technology, I can only imagine that this is an issue that companies are seeing more and more. Uh, Talk a bit about um, industry-wise. I'm sure you hit all industries at this point. Are there some that were earlier adopters to this? Is there a way in which you thought about the kind of unfolding of this business based upon, um, you know, where you saw the most acute needs? Yeah. So, you know, if you look at 10 years ago, I think there was a really strong bifurcation between the people who thought IT was a nice to have and people who thought it was critical. And so, you know, you look at the US federal government or a lot of the friendly federal governments, you look at financial services, uh, healthcare to some extent, they were really kind of on the vanguard of this because uh, you know, even then you could not run financial services in any reasonable way without having IT be kind of the principal element of that. Uh, but what we've found in the last 10 years is that everybody has come along. So if you're running retail environments, manufacturing environments, state and local governments, you start thinking about education, they all have become so dependent on their IT environment to do basic functioning that there's just no room anymore for mediocre operations or security. You have to be great at this, or it almost doesn't matter what you do anymore, you basically can't do it. And 
you know, I think what happened in the last year with COVID and work from anywhere, obviously it was the punctuation point on that, but we've been seeing it for a long time. And, you know, the other thing I would say is security used to be something that financial services, again, government, again, especially DOD, realized they had to do well. But a lot of companies really did 10 years ago see security as a nice to have, that their data wasn't that important. You know, sure, it's a cost of doing business if we get breached. And I think, again, everybody that we talk to in kind of enterprise now realizes that a security event is existential at some level. Uh, and that whether it's ransomware or IP theft or uh, potentially attacking their customers through them, uh, that it's hard to recover from these things if they're bad enough. And so I think that the understanding that both on the operations and the security side that there's urgency uh, has gone way up in the last 10 years. You, you referenced the pandemic. Obviously, it was a scenario whereby the threat landscape proliferated, for so many at least, from the office to, to homes. Uh, mm -hmm. And all sorts of bad actors used this as a tremendous opportunity as the there were a whole range of candy stores they could now go to and visit to, to get the candy they sought. Talk a bit about um, some of the top line. There are a whole range of learnings. We could spend the entire conversation on that, but maybe some of the top line learnings and the the ways in which Tanium responded as a result. You as a leader, you, you as a company uh, responded as a result of that. So, I mean, the first top line learning actually that was super interesting was watching people do things they said were going to take years or sometimes decades in like days. So uh, it's actually fascinating to watch an IT team uh, get called by the CEO and the board and you have to go and send everybody home. And I think a lot of IT teams historically did not believe that we could actually send everybody home and things would work. And there was a lot of heroic in that exercise where people were standing up structures, you know, whether it's VPNs or, uh, you know, things that you could access by cloud that historically had never been cloud enabled uh, in days. And I think that, you know, that actually gave a lot of IT teams the confidence that they could do things they didn't believe they could do. It was amazing to watch. Um, the second one was the network is just not the right place to do anything anymore. So uh, a lot of people went to work from home, whether you use a VPN or you don't, it's not the same from an enforcement standpoint as it used to be when you had everybody in the office. And so you know, this investment that people had made in understanding their network, in managing their network, in managing problems through their network, basically overnight disappeared. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of our industry is trying to adapt to this zero trust new world where you can't trust the network because you don't own it anymore. Um, and I think it's driving fundamental shifts in both security, but also in the way that people are thinking about how they want to architect their environment. Uh, and the third one I would say is we learned that all of the hygiene issues that we'd kind of let lapse for a while, uh, unsurprisingly, came home to roost. So uh, we have a lot of our customers who uh, had not ever done great IT asset management. And when everything is locked in a locked building and nobody is like picking things up and leaving with them, uh, you kind of believe that there's a kind of a container that's keeping everything together. And so that's good. When everything goes home, if you're not tracking your assets, they're not coming back sometimes. Uh, if you don't really know how to distribute software and you have to distribute massive amounts of software because you need to enable Zoom and you need to enable Teams and you need to enable all this stuff overnight, if you don't have a great architecture to do that, uh, you have a very painful process. And I think what ended up happening was kind of the tool capabilities and the hygiene capabilities and kind of the core IT table stakes capabilities that at some level, some people were kind of just saying, we'll deal with that later. It became super emergent to deal with it now because without them, uh, the rate of change that they were trying to drive in the pandemic was not possible. And so I think it forced a lot of people to look at their kind of good enough in their own mind, quote unquote, tools and realize they were nowhere near good enough and that they had to really accelerate tool upgrading as well so that they had the, the, the toolbox to be able to actually adapt to the new world. You referenced earlier that uh, 
as your company grew, there were certain industries that had a greater appreciation for IT and recognized it as strategic earlier. And many of those actually were the ones who recognized that part and parcel of that that conclusion is that security is very important as well. Um, it's It's been fascinating as I think about the 13, 14 years since you founded your business, even just having spent a lot of time with uh, technology teams and technology executives myself, how this has gone from um, and I'm, I'm recapitulating a little bit of what you've said, but just adding a little bit of color here, gone from a an esoteric topic to a board level topic uh, yeah. in so many organizations. Uh, you know, most thir- 13, 14 years ago, most companies probably did not have a CISO. Uh, now that's a de rigueur uh, position for just about any organization, especially one of a certain size and a certain level of complexity. Um, I- I'm curious. So a lot of the you know the 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 people are in place. Uh, the processes are being formulated. The tech, the technology and tooling is in place, and an ecosystem built in order to uh, ensure that you know that 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 the organization's most critical assets are in fact uh, safer than they once were, and so on. But as you look across the landscape of companies that you serve and ones you're familiar with, how how far have we come, and how far do we have left to mature uh, across large organizations? So. Maybe I'll start from a, a little bit of a different kind of place on the answer to that question. If, if I look at the IT environment and I look 10 years ago, the business lines were driving the decision making in almost every case that we used to see. So business would come and IT was an enablement function, a cost center that like facilities or like, you know, the people who procure paper who would be you know, necessary for the functioning of the business. And I think that organizational structures reflected that. They were not actually the decision makers. They were not even, you know, the, the business would come and say, here are my set of requirements and IT would have to build it like a contract manufacturer. What's happened in the last 10 years is IT actually is not only a seat at the table, but I think is getting to the point where it can actually help the business understand how the business can mature. So, you know, I think there are a lot of people in almost every industry who are not as facile as their IT teams in understanding how they can unlock more TAM because they have data that they didn't really understand the value of. They didn't know how to mine that data. They didn't know how to expose that data, how to productize that data. And IT knows how to do that now. And most of the IT leaders I know are really spending a lot of time thinking about how they can, instead of being a cost center, can be a business enabler. And part of that is actually productizing what IT can do that product line business owners often don't understand how to do. That's given IT not only a seat at the table because security is important, it's given them a seat at the table because they're enabling the business. And so, you know, when I look at the transformation and their influence, it's pretty incredible in some companies. When we think about insurance companies and cyber insurance being a leg of the stool in their business practice and the cyber teams driving that insurance process in a lot of companies. When I think about FinServe and I think about blockchain, I think about what they want to do there. In many cases, IT is part and parcel in that process. When I think about a lot of manufacturers, the data that's being generated by the things they manufacture, that IT is helping the business productize into its own service that they can sell back to customers. Those are the kind of things that just didn't happen 20 years ago. And I mean, selfishly, I think it's really healthy because I think that our use cases around collecting really great data uh, become much more valuable when the point of getting that data is not just more IT processes, but it's actually driving revenue. Yeah, that's powerful and a great insight. Uh, uh, it's been enheartening to see the greater number of technology digital executives getting much more involved in the in both sides of the uh, profit equation, the revenues as well as the cost savings and so on. I, um, I should also say, by the way, I think most boards are trying to find people who can sit on the other side of the table at the board level, definitely at the executive level outside of IT who understand these things. Because look, 20 years ago, this wasn't a discussion. 20 years from now, I think it's the, one of the only discussions. And uh, I think we're seeing aggressive transformation of the boards that we work with so that they are well-placed in the executive teams we work with to actually facilitate this transformation instead of 
kind of ask thoughtful sounding questions. They actually want to understand it well enough that they can drive it. And it's great for the IT teams as well as for the business. Certainly represents progress. Um, I I wanted to also ask you about, um, you know, competition today is less company to company than ecosystem to ecosystem. Who are you marshalling together uh, in order to deliver all that you do, whether it's through your supply chain, your joint ventures, you know, a variety of different ways in which an ecosystem is manifested. And I know you're somebody who thinks an awful lot about the, the partnerships that you develop as a means of of furthering the value that your company can provide to customers. Talk a bit about this concept of ecosystem from your perspective and how you've thought about curating the one that you were a part of. Yeah, so it's super fascinating. Uh, I'm going to say something that I think everybody already probably knows, but I'll say it anyway. Um, There is such a land grab in so many areas of IT and technology today that the drive to partner is high, but also what partners are willing to do to help each other, I've never seen be more acute, be higher. So, you know, I look at the cloud providers and I think about what they're willing to do to go out on a limb for somebody who's willing to move their service onto their cloud. And brutal honesty, it's possibly gotten to the point where the cloud providers are leaning over too hard and offering things they shouldn't offer because uh, they want to turn their workloads so hard that they're willing to make their sales teams available, their marketing teams available. They're willing to give you access to almost anything in their company if you're willing to work on their cloud. Uh, I look at a lot of the kind of more established companies uh, in our industry, even if they're not cloud driven uh, and the desire to partner because it drives growth and growth is so appealing in today's market for so many people, because I think the public market really values growth these days. Um, We're seeing an environment that is probably more conducive to partnership than I've ever seen before. When I look at who I want to partner with, there are really only two kind of characteristics. So the first one is I need people who can actually help my customers. And I think that, Uh, There's a customer centricity that pervades some companies. And I would say Salesforce is a great example, which is a company that we work with very closely, where the discussion of customer is constant within that environment, what they want, how to help them. Uh, I think that, you know, it's a very customer oriented culture. And for us, that's a requirement because I've seen a lot of companies that are much more predatory in the way that they engage their customers. And I think it's incredibly difficult to align a company like ours, which is very customer focused with somebody who is a much more predatory kind of, they see customers as food rather than partner. Um, you can't bridge that gap. So that that's one. Uh, and the second one is I want somebody that I can trust. And so, you know, it, it's interesting because I've been doing this now for 14 years, plan on doing this for a while longer. And what y- you can do, I guess, is you can build transactional partnerships that work for six months and then don't work and kind of lily pad your way across with those, you know, transactional partnerships. But the best partnerships I've engaged in sometimes go on for decades, either with people or with technology companies. And you need somebody whose culture you trust, but also people you trust. And that really often comes from good alignment on what you need. But I think it's also some companies really you know, they're carnivorous by nature. They like eating their partners. And uh, you don't want to partner with somebody like that because if you do, eventually you're going to have a fight on your hands. And even if it's productive in the short term, in the long term, uh, customers end up being really disenfranchised because that partnership fails and they were counting on it. Uh, you co-founded this company with your father, David Hindawi. Um, yep. You took over in February 2016 as CEO. You succeeded him. Um, Talk a bit about founding this with your with your father. It's an unusual pairing. Oftentimes, companies like yours do have co-founders. Uh, at times, related, there's some famous brothers or you know sisters or that that, that have founded founded companies. Uh, fewer of them, though, that that go across the generations like you have. Talk a bit about that experience. Yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting. You know, when I was 17, I was going to be going into college. And uh, I was going to go to Cal and become a physics professor. That was my plan. And um, David was starting his first 
well, it's not his first company, but the first company I was part of uh, at the time. And he just said, you know, it would be great if you came along uh, and started this with me, you know, worked on it with me. And, you know, it's funny because I think the whole kind of founder narrative has been mythologized. But when you're starting a company, I mean, the first question is, what are we planning on doing? And then the second question is, can somebody start doing something? It's not actually that like, you know, ivory tower planned. It's more, you know, we've got an area we want to work on now. How do we kind of get some momentum? And it doesn't actually even matter which direction you're going. If you want to go somewhere, it actually matters less about, are we going in the perfect direction? And it's more a question, can we just get some momentum going somewhere so that we can learn something and then course correct? And I loved that process. I loved working with him. Uh, David is an incredibly humble, kind, thoughtful, experienced person. I mean, I'm biased, but I really believe every one of those adjectives. And Big Fix, our first company, this was back in 97, um, it was a learning experience, I think, for both of us. We did some things really well. Uh, I think we actually built a really good product. We did some things really badly. So when I say I'm really proud of our board, I think it's a really uh, incredible board. We, we just added Ash Carter, the former Secretary of Defense, yesterday to our board. And like being able to talk to somebody like that on a regular basis about how we can help the world is a huge luxury. We did not have at Big Fix. We had a really subpar board. Um, we had a control structure that was really fractured. We had a lot of employees who, because we'd had to raise money enough times, had gotten confused about our mission. We had, we had some things that were really suboptimal. And so when we sold that company, uh, David and I spent some time thinking about what do we want to do? And there was a real opportunity to retire. And like at the age of 27, I don't re recommend retiring to anybody, but like, uh, I tried it. It didn't work very well. But we, I think, came to the conclusion very quickly that we loved running companies. And I think we still do, both of us. Um, he's the executive chairman of the company now. He's super involved in the company still. Um, and so we started Tanium. And we had the luxury of not making the same mistakes we'd made the first time. And so, you know, it's funny because me and my father were very, very close. We talk all the time. I, I, I mean, implicit trust is like understatement of the year. I know that he wants what's best for the company and best for me and vice versa. And there are huge luxuries there. And I think his humility as a human has allowed us to work well together because I think he's made incredible amounts of space, not just for me, but for everybody else in the company. Uh, and I don't see that characteristic in a lot of people, especially not in tech companies, where I think we've developed sharp elbows because it's acceptable here in this industry in a way that I don't think it's actually acceptable in most industries. And I don't think it's a good quality. And I think David's the opposite of that. So, you know, I think he made it easy for me to work with him. And I love working with him. And, you know, if we started another company, we would do it together. You know, it's, it's, it's an enormous luxury. And I will say the other thing is, you know, I have a lot of my friends who see their parents because they live in different places five times a year, two times a year. I see my father every day. And I end up seeing my mom almost every day. And uh, she gives me a laundry list of things that I need to work on and do. And he helps me build Tanium. And I, I'm obviously over trivializing, but like, um, it's, it's a luxury. It's, it's a huge gift to be able to work with people you love and have it work. That's fantastic. Well, clearly he has, uh, he is your father after all. And so he's reached uh, an age when many people have retired, but has chosen to continue to be very active. If I have my dates correct, last year you turned 40. Uh, you've got clearly got a lot of, 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 under any sort of normal circumstance, a lot of runway. Uh, very few people re retire at 27 and, and, and still even uh, a, lo a lot of them have rarely retire at 40 either. Um, do you foresee a pathway like your father's where you're working well past uh, the typical retirement age, despite the fact that um, you have the wherewithal uh, not to have to if you didn't want to? I love working. I love it to the point where uh, Jackie, my wife, will remind me that sometimes that's not actually uh, good. And, 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 you know, it's interesting because 
vacation for me, and I realized this over time, where I put my phone down is more stressful for me than vacation, where I read my phone for an hour a day. I love the information flow. I love the data. Uh, I'll tell you the truth. I don't know what size of a company we get to before I realize that there are parts of the job that I don't love. And I think one of the things, another thing that our industry doesn't do very thoughtfully is encourage what Frank Slootman realized at ServiceNow and what a lot of, I think, other really thoughtful people realize, which is the constitution of your job changes a lot as you scale. And the skill set necessary to be able to do a great job changes as you scale. And there comes a point, I think, in almost every founder-led company when the founder is not the optimal person to run the company. And it's just a question of do you trust the people around you enough and do they trust you enough for somebody to say the emperor has no clothes? Um, I really hope that doesn't happen soon. Uh, I really think that there's some of this that's under my control, which is I can choose to grow. Uh, but there will come a time, I'm confident, where that asymmetry rears its head. And what I can tell you is I'm not very good at golf. Uh, <laughs> if I were, I still probably wouldn't be able to find enough soul nourishment in it. I love the mental stimulation and I love the access to thoughtful people. I love solving a problem that I think is really interesting. I love being able to give back to the world in some useful way. Uh, and all of these are uh, things that this job allows me to do and that I think working allows you to do. So that's a long-winded way of saying, I think it would be hard for me to imagine retiring ever. You've spoken um, in our past conversations, but also in this conversation, you've alluded to uh, some of the corrosive aspects of Silicon Valley. Yep. Um, you've chosen, you're, you're, you were raised in Berkeley in addition to going to, uh, to school there. Uh, okay. California is your home. Uh, but you made a choice in the past year to move. You now are in Seattle. Uh, you have, a, a, if I understand correctly, less of an emphasis on California as the place to grow. Uh, and you have some pretty uh, strong opinions about uh, about California, and which was part of the driver of, of the change that you and your family sought. Talk a bit about your perspectives. Yeah, you said California is my home, and two years ago I would have agreed with you, but it's distinctly not my home. In fact, I haven't been back in almost a year, and I, I think that that's probably going to continue for a while. I think that there's a real danger in the general case in getting overconfident. And I think that, you know, if people didn't get overconfident, if companies didn't get overconfident, if industries, locations, uh, that you would really have a different world, but they do. And I think that California, uh, quite recently, as well as over the last 20 years, was taking its companies for granted. And I think it finally reached a breaking point. I mean, we are at a point now where it's just not that much fun to live in San Francisco. And I love San Francisco still to this day. I lived there for years in the city and then outside of the city my whole life up until a year ago. There's some incredible aspects of that location, of that topography, the proximity to a lot of things like Napa and Tahoe. And like, I'm you know, not gonna be the <clears throat> guy running the tourist bureau there, but like everyone knows that there are some great things, but bad governance kills cities and it kills states, it can kill countries. And I think that California got complacent. And I think that the breaking point, and look, to be honest, we've been thinking about this for years. My family has been thinking about it for years. Um, but the breaking point was uh, work from anywhere, which, you know, obviously in February of this year, last year, I should say, uh, became the reality. And once that happened, we very quickly told our employees, you can go move anywhere in the country that you live in because I'm not going to be a hostage taker. If you are living in a small apartment paying $4,000 a month in San Francisco, and you could just as well, because we can't see each other in person, do that job from a palace in most of the rest of the country for the same amount of money, it's cruel to ask people to stay. And so we very quickly told people uh, in March, you've got the ability to move anywhere you want in the country you live. And we had a ton of people take up uh, us up on that. So. A lot of people left. I was one of them. 
And I was really explicit. We are moving to Seattle because we love Seattle. And, you know, uh, there are pluses and minuses about everywhere, but, uh, you know, the pluses far outweigh the minuses for our family. I don't expect people to move here. We happen to have people here, a lot of people, and there's a ton of talent and it's a great place for us to hire and we will do that. But we're going to hire everywhere else too, because it turns out there are super smart people everywhere. And that is probably more acutely true today than it's ever been because a lot of my friends who used to live in San Francisco moved everywhere other than San Francisco in the last year. And many of them are going to stay. And so having a remote first culture, I think is a huge strength, but I, I will tell you this. I think that California has the potential to reinvigorate itself. Everywhere does. Every company does. I mean, we work with IBM and I think IBM has gone through a tough cycle, but I actually think they have an incredible opportunity to reinvent the company. And I think we want to help them with that. Um, I think California can do that. But I think that you have to have an awareness and I see this in IBM and I wish I saw this in California, that something was wrong. And I think that a lot of people have gotten so used to the political narrative that they're not actually telling themselves the truth. And the truth is that raising kids around needles and homelessness isn't fun for anybody. And I really want to see California fix that. And like, if I thought that there were actual appetite to fix the problems at their root, this would have been a different discussion. But until I see that, I think it's really hard to voice that on my people. And I'll just say like, you know, we used to have our conference in San Francisco. We moved it not because I wanted to, we moved it because we got so many complaints from our customers. That sucks. I don't want to be the person who's asking my people, whether they work for me or they work with me or they pay my salary to do things they don't want to do. And so I've got a lot of my friends who moved to Austin and Denver and Nashville and Miami and Seattle and Sun Valley and all over the place. And they're really happy and I can't blame them. And I, I think, frankly, I don't think California should blame them either. And I, and I think we as a nation need to get back to really strong governance because if we don't, I think this is going to happen more and more. Hmm. Very interesting perspectives. I appreciate you sharing them, Orion. Uh, well, let's look to the future a bit. Um, what, do you, what do you foresee for the company? What, what are some of your strategic priorities as you look ahead one, two, three years? Uh, what, what, what sorts of what will be some of the differences in the company or, or additional areas in which you, you um, aspire to get into uh, sure. that are new for you? When I think about Tanium, I think we've done an incredible job with Fortune 500, Global 2000, very large enterprise companies getting visibility and control over their assets. And the biggest kind of two opportunities I see in front of us are serving the wide swath of customers that aren't in that very rarefied air. So you start looking at, even if we are not starting with SMB and mid-market, you start looking at smaller enterprises, then mid-market customers, then SMB, and they all actually have the same needs. It's just a question of, can we make our technology easy enough to consume and use that they can use it effectively? And I think we've spent a huge amount of energy on that problem in the last year, I think very successfully, in the last couple of years, actually, uh, between launching Tanium as a service, which is cloud-hosted, uh, a lot of work on the interface, a lot of work on kind of getting value out of the system immediately and not having to have a lot of training. And the second one is if we look at what we do as a system of record for data and control over everything with a chip in it, uh, there are a lot of adjacencies that are really obvious. So I want to be able to create workflows on that so that I can actually drive an ITSM, an ITIL process. And it turns out ServiceNow is incredible at that, but it turns out there's actually space to innovate in that market that I don't think ServiceNow is driving. And so our Salesforce partnership drives that. Uh, when we think about cloud migration, and what's inhibiting cloud migration within our customer base. Uh, and whether it's our current customers or smaller customers, I think it's actually the same problem, which is uh, they may have compliance requirements that they don't know how to solve in cloud. Uh, and they may end up in a situation where they don't actually know what to migrate and to, who to migrate it to. And so when we look at working with IBM and some of our cloud providing uh, partners, a lot of it is around solving those problems. We have the data, we have the control plane. Now, how do we create an ecosystem where 
these bigger problems can be solved between us and somebody who's an expert in the other side of the problem. And so, you know, I think you're going to see that Tanium has a lot of opportunities to go into these adjacent markets with partners and build really unique capabilities. And it all starts from the basic premise that our data is just way more complete and better. It's faster, it's more scalable, it's more flexible. And as a result of that, I can give you data that is super trustworthy. So, you know, just to kind of put a pin on that, I routinely am talking to customers who will tell you that if their CMDB is 85% accurate, it's great. And my next question is, you know, first of all, what other data source in all of, of not only IT, but business, would you feel okay with being 85% accurate on? Like, this is, you know, revenue, facilities data, you wouldn't accept that anywhere. And the second one is you want to drive automation and end user self-service and self-healing. You want to drive automated compliance, continuous compliance. You want to do all these things. You want software license management events to be a, non a non-event because you've got really strong data. If I can give you three or four nines accurate data, all those things become feasible. And I think you know the next leg of our company is unlocking those value props. We've got a lot of these huge customers that have figured it out themselves, right? Taking that data source and driven workflows off of them that drive automation and end user self-service and self-healing and all the stuff I talked about. I need to make that more digestible for everybody else because everyone's got those same problems. And to be honest with you and work from anywhere, it's really, really painful when you've got a user and they can't use their computer because there's nothing else they can do. They can't go to an office and have a meeting and come back and IT fixed it. You can't do that anymore. Uh, and so I think the standard of helping users be secure and operating well is going up. And I think we owe our customers a much better answer than what the industry is giving them. And I think every one of those areas is huge opportunities for our company. You, you're obviously very sophisticated when it comes to matters of cybersecurity. I wonder if there's any practices that you and your family uh, implement personally that you would recommend to people in terms of how they how they could establish better hygiene personally, in addition to the many sure. um, solid recommendations that have come out of this conversation in terms of the, the corporate or enterprise setting. I mean, look, there are a ton of recommendations that I would give around enabling multi-factor and the right kind of multi-factor around, you know, password protection and being thoughtful about not reusing them around being able to actually pick services where you have a prayer that they're going to do a good job with your data. Um, I think that this is a really unfair asymmetric problem because I, we could record another 10 hours and I would just be getting started about good hygiene in cyber. I guess what I would say is this, look, the number of different people who have your data the lower that number is, the better it is for you. The less you're exposing data that you really, really don't want to expose. So, you know, I'm always shocked when I look at social media and how exposed people are. Uh, that's not actually beneficial from a cyber or, you know, stalking or uh, somebody being able to do identity theft perspective. I think people need to be thoughtful about what they're sharing. And I would say use as few vendors as you can, uh, really enable every security feature they have. And look, companies like Google have exposed incredible security capabilities to their customers to the point where you can tokenize and require a token to be able to use email. I think a lot of people don't wanna walk around with a physical token they have to plug into every device to be able to use their email. But I think you need to make a choice on how much inconvenience you're willing to take to be able to be safe. And uh, I think that there are a lot of recommendations, but like the table stakes ones, use a password manager that you trust. Uh, don't reuse passwords constantly and enable multi-factor. Right there, you've got a lot of your security covered. Don't download apps that you don't really understand from, you know, nice to have apps that come down even from the app store are not safe by definition. Update things when you can. So, you know, you've got Windows update or you've got Mac OS update that will automatically update for you, enable that. But I think the really kind of best recommendation I have is uh, try not to do things that if you think about them for a little bit, like sharing super sensitive data on social media, try and just 
think about those things a couple more times before you do them. Because a lot of the things that I've seen on the personal basis, if you look at them and even the person who did them looks at them and thinks about them for a second, you realize that was bound to have negative consequences. So I, I, I think that's a long winded way of answering, uh, use good judgment. And there are some basic table stakes hygiene things that you definitely have to do. Well, that's a great suggestion. So or Ryan and Dawi, thank you for a dynamic conversation across a whole range of fields uh, covering your entrepreneurial journey, uh, the remarkable growth that you've seen as a business leader at Tanium, uh, your perspectives on cybersecurity, its evolution, the impact of the pandemic, your look to the future, uh, your feelings about San Francisco and, and the future of work. Uh, and the variety of recommendations that have, have come out of this conversation. It's been a very, uh, very interesting one, to say the least. Thank you so much for taking time today. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Excellent.